This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit toward your first job post. Rippling, the world's first way for businesses to manage their HR and IT in one system. For an easier way to onboard and supercharge new employees, go to rippling.com slash twist and get 20% off. And Pilot. Pilot takes care of your bookkeeping from start to finish so you can focus 100% on making your business succeed. Go to pilot.com slash twist for 20% off your first six months of Pilot Core. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups, the show where we talk to founders, investors, pundits, authors about technology, startups, entrepreneurship. And here in our 10th year, we've been really focused on finding the businesses that have grown to become unicorns. Those are companies with a valuation of over a billion dollars, which typically means revenue is going to be 50, 100 or more uh, in order to gain that status as a valuation. The reason is most companies are valued at 20, 30, 40 times their earnings if they're high growth. So if a company makes 50 million in profits a year, times 40, $2 billion, you get the idea. Uh, today on the program, we have JFrog, which uh, has a co-founder and CEO named Shlomi Ben Hayam. Haim, yes. Haim. Hi. Hi, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, and Happy to be here. JFrog produces software for developers and, and sysadmins. And you have customers including Amazon, Facebook, Google, Netflix, and Uber, which is confusing to me because don't Amazon and Google have huge clouds of their own? <laughs> Why would they need JFrog? I mean, I can understand the Netflixes and Ubers um, uh, and even the Facebooks of the world because they don't have cloud offerings, but Amazon and Google have cloud offerings. What is JFrog um, and how do customers like these use it? And welcome to the program. Yes, thank you. I'm uh, excited to be here, Jason. Um, so JFrog, yeah, we, we have 5,000 customers. And actually, I would say that the top 10 of every industry is already a customer of JFrog. That's a side of the very nice and big community we build around our products and solution. I think that the main, the main need that, that uh, software companies or every company that produces or, or work with software need today is to have a fast release program, fast release pipeline. And this is where they start to use JFrog. Also, mm. companies like Amazon and Google and Facebook and those who have giant uh, IT and dev team. Um, basically, we are working with them, with their IT and developers team, or what we call today DevOps, mm. um, to bring software from, from point A to point B fast and secure. So it used to be people would work on a revision or an update to software in a vacuum, and then they would make a big deal out of releasing Microsoft Office 12 mm. or 13 or 14 or Correct. Adobe Photoshop 7 or 8 or 9, and you would buy a new CD-ROM. Now people are just updating that software. How often? How often does Facebook update their software, or Instagram or Uber? So it's, so it's really like a, a very wide um, kind of market. We have customers that will still update once a quarter. Um, I don't think that we see customers that still do once a year release. Yeah. But we see more and more of them pushing software updates seven times a day. So we talk about Facebook mm. and LinkedIn and Netflix. Those guys are, are pushing software on, on, on a daily basis, several times a day. And, uh, and this is uh, how the modern world kind of build the competitive advantage as well, yeah. getting software update f faster. And what is the downside to releasing it that fast? Um, mm -hmm. And what's the upside? Obviously, the upside, I think, is clear. You get to delight customers, make things more efficient. But what's the downside to doing that? I think you just touched the point of why the DevOps revolution is happening. We need to have... Um, a delight experience with customers, with end users. Mm. Sometimes it's not even human being. Sometimes it can be a machine or device that need to be updated. Unfortunately, we got this very uh, unfortunate uh, reminder a month ago with the Boeing, right? With the Boeing software update. Mm. 170 people just lost their life because of software update. Wait, what, is, what was that? The oh, Boeing the Boeing, Max. the Boeing, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's and the an news, exact. all over the news, it was just about software update, didn't happen, putting aside the 700 aircraft that were grounded. Right. No, we have a loss of life there. Exactly. And that was due to 
over complex software and poor training is what people seem to think? So it's still under investigation according yeah. to what I read. I don't yeah. have any uh, internal yeah. information, but, uh, but it was clear from, from the first investigation that the software on the Boeing Max sensors was not updated as wow. needed. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. It's crazy. Um, and so how do you charge for your software? What, how do people pay for it? What, what is the m business model? Mm -hmm. um, is it, are you part of the cloud or these people have their own cloud? So is this something that sits before the cloud? And what is the main feature that people pay for? So when we started 10 years ago, it started as an open source project. We, we built something with the community, for the community, by the community, something just to ease the pain on developers. It was way before the, the term DevOps was so popular. Define DevOps for people who don't know what that means. They know what a developer is. And they yes. should know what ops is. That's the operation like in the data center. Exactly. When you put those two words together, what does it mean? How can you bring the, the right side, which is more like the runtime, and the left side, which is the developer, closer to each other? Mm -hmm. So you will shrink the, the transition of software from, from the moment it was built until the moment it is consumed Got in it. a fast and secure way. And so a developer might write the code to change something in LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Then it has to go on the servers and go into the live production. Correct. And that's where there can be problems. I guess things can crash, things can be bad code, or they, they might work. Vulnerabilities, yeah. viruses, all kind of things that you don't want to push. And when people say DevOps, are they saying the dev is taking over the ops or the dev or developers are just closer to the operations? I think that the DevOps industry kind of provided a common ground for IT people, the mm. ops team, the security team, and the developers. Mm. It used to be just not so long ago, and still some, some, some organizations are following these methodologies, that developers will do everything quick and dirty, like just building and, and pushing, building and pushing, and there is someone at the end of this tunnel that is taking care of um, releasing and, and pushing. Um, and now, as you need to, to push seven times a day, you have to do it right from, from, the, first, from the first point. Hmm. So I think that DevOps, the DevOps industry kind of provided a common ground to manage hmm. a pipeline that both the ops guys that are responsible for the production and the runtime and the developers are sharing. You guys tried to raise venture capital and couldn't in the beginning? And where was the company started? Was it started in Israel or started here? Yes, the company started in Israel yeah. uh, in 2008. Um, actually, Great um, timing. <laughs> right during the financial crisis, you decided to start a company. Genius. Well, Joav Landman, our co-founder and CTO, and Fred Simon, our chief architect and, uh, and, and co-founder, uh, they, they came up with the, with the idea of Artifactory, which was a, a proxy for the Java community just to bring software home and help you build it faster. And, um, and, and then we, we realized that, uh, that there is a real need to, to solve this, this pain. Mm. But it started just as a side project, as an open source project, and started to be adopted by the community and massively used by big organization. And this is where we realized that this is something that needs to be developed. And the VCs, it actually is a good time to start when the market's down because you don't have com competition and you can deploy capital um, at a very uh, low cost, right? I mean, you can, mm -hmm. there's a lot of developers were available in 2008, but it starts as an open source project and you fund it, what, friends and family? So uh, that's a very good uh, question, Jason. Kind of brings me back. Uh, JFrog is our second venture. You offered and I going back like something 18 years back. Wow. Um, we had a company that we ran named Alpha CSP. It was acquired in 2005. And then we decided to step out and, and found JFrog around Artifactory, which is our flagship product. Three months after uh, the market crashed. Yeah. Open source was there, but developer tools kind of, um, all, most of the VCs we met told us that there is no market for developer tools. Huh. And when we tried to explain that this is not developer tools, we didn't have the word to explain what DevOps is. What is this transition and revolution that we are experiencing? And therefore, for the first four years, we funded JFrog by ourselves. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that actually winds up saving the cap table. You don't have to dilute. Uh, exactly. All right, when we get back from this quick break, what did it take then to raise money from investors 
and convinced them that there was a big enough market here when we get back on This Week in Startups. If you need to hire somebody, go to LinkedIn. That's how I'm finding all my great people. Charles, who works with us in the studio and records This Week in Startups, we found him. He had a full-time job, but he was a passive job seeker. What that means is he wasn't out there actively looking, but when he was on LinkedIn getting messages from his friends and updating his profile and reading the news, he saw an ad for the studio director position for This Week in Startups, and he said, that looks interesting. That podcast, I listened to it. Oh, wow, they have an opening? Let me take a look. Let me just browse browse through this opportunity and you know what happened he clicked and he applied and we found somebody who wasn't looking for a job in a low uh unemployment situation like we have in the united states if people are out there looking they're the last two or three percent of people who are trying to find jobs the most experienced people are in high demand and you want to find those passive job seekers and that's what we did we have hired i think three people now uh, our marketing manager at marine uh, up in toronto and we do this through LinkedIn. So hurry over, go to linkedin.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, and you will get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash twist to get $50 of 50 right now for you at linkedin.com slash twist. Terms and conditions apply. It works. Go use it. I'm telling you, I would not steer you wrong. We use it. We love it. LinkedIn.com slash twist. 50. Hey, welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. Today on the program, the co-founder and CEO of JFrog, Shlomi Ben Hayam. Correct. There we go. Boom. <laughs> uh, I'm from Brooklyn. I should. I mean, Shlomi's pretty easy for me. We got, had a it lot is. of Shlomi's in Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, a lot of bagel shops uh, where I grew up in Bay Ridge. Um, and so when did you move the company from Israel to the U.S. or still based in Israel? No, no. I'm based here. I moved with my family, my wife and three daughters uh, oh. in 2013. Yeah. We moved to uh, Los Altos, living in the Bay Area. We have our swamp, JFrog office in Sunnyvale. So, uh-huh. In the swamp in Sunnyvale. <laughs> in the swamp of <laughs> Sunnyvale. We, we call all of our offices the swamps. Got it. The American swamps is, yeah. uh, is in Sunnyvale and Seattle. You uh, fund it yourself, 500K, friends and family. When do you first get VCs interested in the company? And what did you have to show? in order for them to be interested? Because they didn't believe initially, Mm -hmm. but at some point they did believe, and and what was the change? You know, I think that every entrepreneur needs the first believer that Mm. will say, okay, here's here's some money, go and build the business. And and, and I'm coming from, from, you know, from a background of, of building a business and Fred and Yoav, my partners, they build the technology. So it was obvious to me that before you go to a VC, you should first show some, some demand. Hmm. And uh, we actually came several times to meetings when we had in our portfolio already companies like EMC, Netflix, LinkedIn, hmm. Cisco, great companies that already pay for our product and, uh, and still the, the atmosphere in the room was this is developer tools the market cap is around 100 maybe 200 million it's not big enough hmm. and um, and we started to develop the story of what of what jfrog is hmm. we never had an elevator pitch because by default this is a story for for developers and for technical people so one of the uh, investors once told me you either need a very tall building or a very old elevator because you cannot pitch that. Yeah. And um, slowly we started to build more and more uh, need in the, in the market. We developed our second product, Bintray. And um, in 2012, we had Gemini, an Israeli fund, with one very unique uh, veteran investor, Yossi Sela, that, uh, that, took, you know, the next leap with us and uh, and invested three, the first $3 million in the company. Wow. And for that, he got 20% or something in that range? 30, 10, 20, it, 30%? It was, yes, around this range. It, yeah. it was, uh, um, we, we still had our experience from previous companies. So we wanted to, um, um, to build the right uh, the right steps in the in the cap table, and yes, around twenty percent was the first investment. Wow! And now that's been paid off because uh, you guys raised one hundred and sixty-five million Series D from Inside Venture Partners last year. Mm-hmm. This is correct. It took me four years to raise the Series A, and three weeks to raise the Series D. 
<laughs> really? Yes. Well, at the series, and what's the difference between what you're trying to prove in the Series A and the Series D for founders who maybe have done the Series A but haven't done the D? What's the difference? What's the process like? I think that the one thing that really shocked me, and, and there is the series B and C in the middle, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a kind of evolution. But one thing that shocked me was that series A is all about the technology, the idea, the product, and can you disrupt the market with what you have? Mm. And the series D is all about, or at least the series D that we had, which is mainly a, a late stage pre-IPO kind of uh, fundraising. It's more about is this going to be a big business or it's going to be another company that will be acquired? Mm. And it's more about the business and how fast the business is growing, more aligned with, uh, with the factors that Wall Street look like, mm. look at. And, and, and in our Series 8 was all about technologies. Most of the time I was introducing Fred of Yav and Yav and lay back and let them talk. And right. Series D, it was, I think, the opposite. Ah, so Series A, you're trying to sell the technology and the vision for what it could do in the world. Series D, you're trying to present exactly how much money this could make, how big is the addressable market, uh, and how fast is it growing, I guess. Exactly. And this and is a market that didn't exist. Ex when, when we created JFrog, there was no budget line for what we had. Like, we right. couldn't even explain what we replaced. It was hmm. replacing homegrown solution or bad habit, or what you will need in the future in order to release faster. Right. In Series D, that was not a question. It was more about benchmark. Like, show mm -hmm. me another company that, do, that how, does how the same. How is revenue growing year over year? Is it double, triple? What is the expectation when you get to this level where you're making, I'm assuming, tens of millions of dollars a year? So in, in the last three years, we have grown our revenues in more than 600%. Wow, yes. six acts in three years. Yes, and and JFog is is growing fast. But I learned another thing in today's market: going fast is one thing. When when you think about maybe going public, it's also about growing steady. It's not mm -hmm. just about this roller coaster of seventy percent one year, forty percent the other. You want to build a trusted growth uh, cycle. So. It has to be predictable in a way. Yes. What does the average customer spend with you per year? What is the average ticket size? You said 5,000 customers. They spend 100,000 each or something like that or 50,000. So we we have customers that will spend uh, $10,000 per server and we have customers that w will cost the, the $1 million. Wow. The one very, very unique thing about JFrog is that we have this amazing portfolio that I'm honored to have with all these great names but we don't have sales. It's all inside and inbound sales. Wow. All inside and inbound. We never knocked on someone's door. There is no one customer in the world that got a product pitch before he started the trial and tried it for himself or started with the open source version. Right. And the open source version is available for people to use for free. What's the difference and what do you build around the paid version? Because you're not the only person to do this playbook. Obviously, WordPress is an open source project. You Correct. can download it, put it on your server and pay WordPress, the company, zero dollars. So how do you convince people to pay? What is it that you get with the paid product that you don't get with the open source one? So as I mentioned, the open source project started as a, as a side project to help developers. Mm. And, and when you look at the organization of one, two, maybe five developers, this is good enough for them. They will usually use Java or something else. They will start building their um, development environment and, and tool stack. And then when they go enterprise or when they go and build an organization and they need to actually share uh, artifacts and share pieces of software, this is where they need some enterprise level features uh, like highly available solutions, clustered solution, all kinds of integration with universal solutions, um, better integration and faster integration with the ecosystem. And in today's world, developers can do everything. They can build it by, by themselves, but, but we do it faster for them when we provide them the enterprise version of, of JFrog. All right, when we get back from this next break, I want to ask you about the 800 gorilla, pound gorilla in the room, which is Amazon. Uh, Amazon Web Services has been on a tear. I've been on the board of a couple of companies. I was on the board of Dyn, which did DNS routing, and all of a sudden Amazon decided 
they would get into DNS routing or uh, <laughs> MailChimp and SendGrid all of a sudden had to contend with. Yeah. And uh, Mongo and Elastic. And, and, a lot, yeah, a and lot they seem to be uh, pretty cutthroat, but they haven't gotten into developer tools. So when we get back, I don't believe, when we get back from this break, how do you look at Amazon as both a customer and a competitor when we get back on This Week in Startups? Rippling is a new product that makes it incredibly easy for you to manage your HR and IT functions in one system. We've been using it and we love it. Every minute you spend updating employee data and systems is a minute that you don't need to spend. You could be putting that into your software, into your product, into your startup. There are other companies that help you on HR, but only Rippling can help you manage your HR and your IT together. Imagine if you could hire one in just 90 Imagine if you could hire someone in just 90 seconds and take care of all their HR. This is the easiest way to take care of your employees' payroll, health insurance, 401k, and so on. But also, you get their computer and security and sign-on and access to all your organization's apps. Slack, Gmail, GitHub, Zendesk, all that stuff. Whatever you're using, imagine just 90 seconds, boom, they're up and running. So run your business like a well-oiled machine that connects your HR and IT. So you can manage your to-do list in one place with just a few clicks. Inside.com, we've been using it and we love it. We have a huge remote team at Inside and Rippling has made it super easy for us to manage everything with just a click of a button. So if you're looking for an easier way to onboard and supercharge new employees, go to Rippling.com twist, Rippling.com slash twist, and you'll get 20% off. Obviously, Rippling is R-I-P-P-L-I-N-G.com rippling.com slash twist for 20% off. We love it. We use it. It's awesome. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome back. Israeli Air Force Major Shlomi Ben Hayam is uh, with me. He is the co-founder and CEO of JFrog. Now, wait a second. I've met 300 different Israeli CEOs, and every single one of them is in the Air Force and is a fighter pilot. How does this occur? Because you have about 16 planes in Israel. <laughs> How are there 300 <laughs> pilots? Well, are you a pilot or are you just in the I'm, I'm, I'm not a pilot. Um, <laughs> Do you have a picture of yourself in front of it with the helmet on? <laughs> uh, I had some just to impress my daughters. Exactly. <laughs> and, and actually, my, my first daughter is uh, joining this summer the, the Israeli Air Force. She's going back to Israel. One to year serve. of service? Is that right? Two years. Two, two years. years. Mandatory yeah. service. Yeah, uh, well, she lives here, so she is volunteering. Wow. But I'm very proud of her, obviously, um, and, and she, she's going to well, serve it, her country. And it's an interesting time to do it. We just had over the past week a lot of rockets uh, getting yes, sent over. Yes, every now and then we get this reminder that we live in conflict uh, in the Middle East. But uh, I have but, to say the Israelis are showing a, high, a large degree of patience in this kind of situation and restraint because if this was America – and a couple of missiles got lobbed into San Francisco or Brooklyn, God forbid, like we would not have the patience and I think the... Uh, well, just yesterday, Jason, I sent an email to all the Israeli employees uh, that some of them are staying in the shelter with their kids uh, because of 600 missiles that were shot during Sunday. 600? 600 and more. Um it depends what you call a missile because yeah. some of it is really like mortars, primitive. Yeah, like, primitive um, stuff. Yeah. Most but, of them get shot down, right? You have the shield or... So we have the Iron Dome that was developed in Israel because of the situation. It's a very unique uh, solution uh, to, to protect the Israeli skies. Uh, but still, you know, as, when you run a business, this is something quite unique. You, you have to realize that some of your team is sitting in a shelter now, maybe will not come to work tomorrow. And our heart and thoughts are with this team, yeah. but they are Israeli. They are tough guys, and and, it is, and they know that they will manage. Yeah. I mean, I think it breeds a certain type of founder, too. I mean, if you're thinking you're having a hard day <laughs> here in Silicon Valley, imagine if you had to take your entire team and say, everybody go down to the basement. Okay, now we can come back up and go to work. Yes, there and, is a siren. Everybody's leaving to the basement. There oh is all Lord. kind of drills then. But, uh, but they think that... Uh, you know, this is also very unique to Israeli entrepreneurs. Mm. Um, I have a lot of meetings with people that are coming from big companies and, and in interviews, and, and I'm telling them, 
Are you thinking about this startup mentality or it just look fun from the outside and said, what do you mean? We are part of a small team in Google or in Oracle or in these companies, great companies, all of them, and we act like a startup. And what I'm trying to explain that act like a startup is not a startup. Right. When you are uh, working for a startup, you are in a survivor mode. Hmm. You look at the clouds and you think, how can I... Um, overcome that and right. not just be smashed and swallowed yeah. very Israeli yeah <laughs> no say. survival is critical for founders and I think is why we've seen so many great ones come out of that region is you you're gonna have to survive the missiles landing all over the place and missing payroll and yeah all kind of challenges uh, all kinds of challenges uh, so speaking of challenges back to uh, my teaser before we went to the break mm -hmm. is Amazon gotten into developer tools yet? And how do you think about them? Because obviously they're a customer, obviously your customers use them. Probably the majority of your customers use them. Mm -hmm. How do you, do they do developer tools? Are they competitive with you yet? Well, yes, yes, and yes. Um, we have great relationship with Amazon, with Microsoft Azure, and with GCP, the Google mm -hmm. Cloud. Um, all of them are customers, all of them are um, also vendors, mm. we, we have a hybrid solution, which we call the amphibian solution, obviously with the frog stuff. <laughs> um, we live on-prem on and we live in the cloud, so we provide JFrog as a service on all different cloud. And yes, all of our users are also using Amazon, Azure, or, or GCP. And the answer is yes, they got deeply into developer tools or DevOps industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can see um, all kinds of competitions that starts between the CI, CD world, the continuous integration, the continuous deployment, continuous delivery, they provide services. But when I'm looking at these guys, I think that this is a very big market if you, if you know how to look at this market. But the moment before, when I'm looking at them, I think that they are following a different KPI. Like mm. the clouds, they would like to generate traffic in the cloud. This mm. is, they own the highway. Yeah. And we own the traffic light. Right. So if they provide developer tools, it's not because they want to sell developer tools. Mm. They want to drive traffic into their cloud. Mm. So why not providing um, a MongoDB solution or Elastic solution if it will generate more traffic? Their KPI is consumption. We are here to provide developers and DevOps engineers with a better solution. And I hope that it can, it can work together. Yeah, coexist. So when uh, you raise this kind of money, and you've got predictable revenue. You start thinking about IPOs. How, how does how do you think about an IPO? Are you there? Are you close? Are you because it seems like there are companies that are smaller that have gone public recently. Um, well, you, you guys haven't be. filed, right? To be clear, you should be in my board because I'm yeah. getting this uh, question <laughs> every 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 board meeting. Yeah, I, I think that uh, in JFrog, we we at JFrog we we kind of look at this question as a milestone. That's mm. That's a very important milestone, Go, mm. don't get me wrong. It's not just a fundraising, raising funds from, from the public, but it's also a transition that the company needs to go through and, and to become something that, that the market can accept and trust. Yeah. And, um, and in terms of, of what we see, the benchmark we see, well, just a few weeks ago, the PagerDuty yes. IPO, um, JFOG is ready, like 2020 yeah. is reasonable. Maybe yeah. it would be 2021, maybe it will be earlier, but uh, in terms of revenues, I think PagerDuty went out with $107 million in revenues and, yeah. and they got, what, like 30X? Yeah. 2.8 billion? Yeah. That's crazy, and, and yeah. congrats to, to the team. A great product, also a customer of JFROG. Um, but I think that what, what we see now is that the, that the public market rewarding you for, for three different things. Number one, how big your market is. Mm -hmm. What is your total addressable market? Number two, how fast you grow and steady. Mm. And number three, which is kind, kind of new in the last years, is how efficient you are. Can we trust you to become a business, a profitable business, right. something that we can get our money back and our multiples? And yeah. if you follow that, like Atlassian and PagerDuty, you are being rewarded in, in Wall Greatly, Street. yeah. And yeah. you would then also, if you're a public, have the ability to do acquisitions. Have you guys done acquisitions yet? Or is it something you think about? Are there a bunch of developer tools out there that should be, you know, put together? 
Um, so we 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 acquired five com- five companies oh, and wow. um uh, and and all of them are supporting our vision uh, of getting software all kind of software no matter what you use if it's java or dot net or yeah. ruby or scala or android everything you use must be liquefied getting faster to the mm. end point and so we acquired conan which is uh It's just amazing to know that the C++ community never had a tool that brought them into the huh. DevOps world. So we yeah. acquired an open source company that built that for the C++ uh, community. Uh, we acquired Demon, which, do, um, uh, which are doing other things in AI for, for DevOps and their mm. talents joined us. Uh, we acquired the consulting company, Trainologic, just recently. All of their team joined us as we build our enterprise sales machine. And just recently, we acquired Shipabel, um, which is a very, very advanced CI, CD tool that will help us move all those pieces through the pipeline. And for C-level, not just for developers, but also for managers, we acquired a company called CloudMunch um, two years ago that provided a dashboard that you as a manager can see all of, all of those moving pieces on whatever topology you have. So five different companies. That we acquired kind of overwhelming but uh, but we are working on how do you integrate them without breaking them what have you learned about integrations do you try to let them just keep doing what they're doing and give them autonomy do you take the annoying stuff that they have to deal with accounting HR obviously are easy to take away but how do you think yeah. about and what have you learned from this acquisition spree I'm still learning still learning. <laughs> we all are <laughs> um, I I think that Jacob uh, J- Jay Frog yeah Jacob is our CFO I'm yeah always confusing yeah um, Jay Frog was always focused on technology and yeah. value so we were not after revenues we, n- mm. we never bought the company for revenues or mm. install base maybe in f- in the future we will um, and we always brought the missing pieces from what we have mm. so the goal is to to go faster we can build everything by ourselves but someone who Very talented, just build it, and you might you might build a one plus one that equals fa- four or mm-hmm. five. And uh, that was the methodology. Uh, we always looked at the uh, synergy at the level of the technology, mm-hmm. the strategy, and the culture. We have a very, very um, important thing that we try to preserve in JFOG, and this is the culture thing. Yeah. Um, What is the culture? Yeah. Wow, that's uh, a great question. You know when I moved to uh, to the u s that was the second swamp we opened the second office yeah. and 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 I woke up one night sweating um thinking that everything that we built in in the last four years or five years before I moved is collapsing back in Israel and I have yeah. no control and and I called my c o o orit and uh, my v p of h r Karen and I asked them to to come up with a program that can preserve something. That is not just Shlomi speaking with the team. It's the team speaking with us, yeah. telling us what the culture is. Yeah. And we came up with a few questions asking uh, our employees, what is JFOG for you? Yeah. After two days, we got 250 applications back in their world. Some of them with typos, very basic. And we put it all together under categories and we called it the JFOG Codex. Mm. And the Codex is nothing about technology. Some of the values are... You will not find it uh, somewhere else, like right. care and win and 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 other things that represent what the what a frog is. Mm-hmm. And we always say that even if tomorrow we are moving to another company under another logo, these are still the values that that should lead us. And the most important thing, it was written by the frogs. It was yeah. not written by the managers down. It was written by the employees up telling us. What JFOG should be, and every year we run a survey to question ourselves whether we are following the codex or not. All right, when we get back from this final break, I, I want you to tell me the state of the developer pipeline. Are we making enough, and what do we need to do here in the United States, Israel, and across the world to get more developers into the game? Because it very seems like we are short millions of developers right at this very moment, and it doesn't seem like we're filling that pipeline. So let's talk about the developer pipeline when we get back on This Week in Startups. If you're a startup listening to this podcast, you need to keep accurate books because you're going to be raising money, you're going to be going into due diligence, and you want to make sure that your books are tight. 
and Pilot is the group that will do that with you. They will help you keep track of your finances and they are a bookkeeping company that is, and this is super important, they're focused just on startups. They know you're a startup, they know what your needs are, and they will give you a dedicated account manager who takes care of all of your books and sends you accurate detailed financial reporting every month so that you, your board, your team, your investors, everybody's in the loop and you know exactly how many months of runway you have, you know when you're gonna hit break even, you know what you're spending your money on. Pilot bookkeepers are assisted by engineers that automate the most error-prone parts of the accounting work. So think about that. They've got bookkeepers working with engineers to make this process work better and better and better so that your books are always incredibly accurate. And they use accrual-based accounting as well as QuickBooks Online, which is the standard. You're not going to be locked into some Fugazi proprietary system that you don't want to use and that locks you in. So stop spending your time tracking financial statements and making cash flow spreadsheets. Nope. Use Pilot just like Airtable, Lattice, Cleanly, Scale, OpenAI, Mixergy. All these great companies are trusting their books to Pilot. So here is your call to action. I want you to add Pilot to your financial stack and get back to work doing what you do best. The first 100 listeners to this podcast are going to get 20% off Pilot Core for six months. Go to pilot, P-I-L-O-T dot com slash twist, pilot dot com slash twist to get that 20% off right now. Thanks again to Pilot for helping my startups and many other ones keep the books tight. Tight is right. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. Shlomi, developer pipeline how are we going to educate and get enough developers to keep up with the demands of software? And where, where are the, who's doing a great job as a culture, society, et cetera, for training and inspiring young people to go into this field when you look across the world? Because you wow. have the data. Wow. Yeah. wow. Uh, well, you know, it really depends on, on what data you, you, you look at. Um, if you look at GitHub, uh, yeah. 28 million developers. When you ask IDC or Gartner, it's 20, um, which is a, a very impressive number. Growing fast, I think it's 16% year over year. Wow. And, um, and unfortunately, not enough. So adding three million a year is still not enough. Not enough. Not yeah, enough. Yeah, because I heard there's somebody said five, six, seven million open developer jobs in the world. And 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 this is when when you gather everything under one title. Yeah. There, there are subtitles of what the developer is, and and obviously the world is seeking for more. Uh, technical hands with their hands on the keyboard to to produce more software because software is running running the world. We know that. Yeah. And you know, just an example. I I ask my daughters uh, a very simple question when they ask me about what JFrog is and why should I care because it's a tool yeah. for developers. And and then I ask my daughter, are you using Snapchat? She yeah. said yes. Are you using Facebook? Yes. What version? Yeah. She couldn't answer. And the reason is that there is a champion behind this machine that making sure that your experience is is seamless. You don't yeah. you don't have to work on a software update. If you drive a Tesla today, you need to schedule your software update. Yeah. And we all agree that this is this is a computer on wheel. Like Tesla is the most amazing company yeah. ever. You have one? Uh, no, you I wish I one. would. Get the Model 3. It's <laughs> incredible. I, I, I drove it here today, and they literally, when you talk about updates, it updated last night. And now the software in the Autopilot 2, which is, I guess, what I have on one of the cars. The other one has Autopilot 1. If somebody, if you change lanes or somebody changes lanes into you, it will do avoidance. Oh. So, and you've seen, you may have seen some of these videos on the internet where somebody cuts off a Tesla driver, and they were going to hit the car, and the Tesla just gently moves out of the way by itself by itself but oh. doesn't hit the wall because it knows where the wall is it knows yes. there's a car so it just does its best to avoid the car while not crashing into the wall which a human doesn't do all that well when a car cuts you off you might swerve too much but it knows exactly how many inches you know down to probably a tenth of an inch or a, a hundredth of an inch the wall is so we can get right up against the wall and there's some weird moments when you're in a tesla when you're on autopilot where I don't like to be in the left-hand lane because I just get a little bit spooked <laughs> about how close it gets. <laughs> but 
you, you don't need to, you need not be spooked, but it does update. I think they're now updating maybe twice a month. And when I first got it, it would update every three to six months. So they're going faster. They're going faster and they need to do it even faster than that. Yeah. And, and pushing software now to China and pushing software to Europe because yeah. Tesla is not anymore the Silicon Valley story. No. Uh, but we're speaking about Tesla and we're speaking about Boeing and we, yeah. speak, uh, we are speaking about the Facebook and all yeah. of those companies. But even the most basic stuff like PG&E pushed yeah. a software update to their grid a few months ago. And the old valley was under darkness for for a few hours because it didn't work. Oops. <laughs> and and this is the the vital things that we need in life. And I think that when you ask me about developers, yeah. we should ask ourselves what is the next generation of developers? What really they need to know? Because mm -hmm. maybe some of the institutes are still teaching computer science in a way that the ramp up will take longer. And if we need people in the industry fast, teach them what they need to know tomorrow. Yeah, these code schools are doing great. I don't know if you've seen or you have developers coming out of them, but I think it's $20,000, $30,000. And in six months, the person's a reasonable developer. It can't be done in three months, but I've heard six months to 12 months is the sweet spot. If you get somebody working full-time in one of these developer courses, you know, 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, maybe six days a week, they can they can become a functional developer in somewhere in month six to 12. I agree. And then people are spending $250,000 on a four-year degree at a Ivy League school. And Which in the first two years, I'm not saying that it's not important, but you know, we, we should gear up. We should we should understand the demand in the market and, and release more developers to the market because it's it's really kind of the oxygen of every industry today. Yeah. Yeah, everything. Yeah. What about security? Should we be worried with Russian hacking into our machines? China. What worries you about the hacking situation? What do you know about how prevalent it is, how intense it is that we don't know? So obviously, I'm not a security person. I'm yeah. not a security expert, but I see what I see. And yeah. what I see now is that phase one was how can IT ops can get closer to the developer. And phase two is what is it this CISO at the end of the line that rolled back on you and you need to release seven times a day and he even... He even not reporting to your CIO. He reports to legal. This is being changed. The organization is being changed according to the demand in the market. So what you see now is the rise of DevSecOps. Our tool, X-Ray, is about that. You need to make sure that you provide something that scan and alert you while you build, not at the end when you finished and released, ready to be consumed. Yeah. People need to, build, to know about vulnerabilities and dependencies vulnerabilities and to know about um, viruses and license compliance before it get to, to the CISO hand. And both the security industry, the CISOs of the world, and the developers understand that. And again, you see the common CISOs ground. is chief security officers. Correct. Yes, CISOs. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you start to see that everything start to, to be shrinked into this uh, uh, pipeline we call the CICD pipeline between uh, the developer and the production Continuous development. Continuous development, uh, deployment. Deployment. Continuous deployment and continuous integration. And, um, and if you think about the atopic world, the developer in 2019 cannot release something from his hand which is not 100% secured. Right. And he need to use tool and he need to trust, like you trust your Tesla, he need to trust those tools yeah. to tell him whether he is vulnerable or, or not. So DevSecOps is a booming market inside the DevOps market. And you start to see the consolidation of CI continuous integration and DevSecOps into big DevOps platform. Speaking about the cloud, all of them are seeing the same thing and coming up with solutions for the same pain. Yeah, moving faster means more vulnerabilities, potentially more problems, a higher frequency. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting, the Teslas, I think, they people are like, why didn't I get my update? And I'm like, the reason is they probably updated like 100 cars of employees, then 1,000 employees, a thousand. and then 10,000 of the whatever, 500,000 on the road. They're not going to do 500,000 updates and have 500,000 Teslas bricked on the side of the road. Not that I think that's ever happened. I and all the charging points and all the multimedia versus yeah. the self-driving uh, dashboards, so many things. And this is just one company. 
Yeah. Um, so complex. It's still very complex. And, and, and I think that we are in a process of uh, finding the right solution for, for those kind of companies. And this is the whole idea of liquid software. Yeah. This is why I think that DevOps- When you say liquid software, what does it mean? It just means that it flows uh, that continuously. That it flows and software updates run through the developer's pipes like water runs through your pipe. You don't yeah. open the faucet and ask yourself, where is the reservoir? Is it clean or not? It's filtered or not? It's just there. And um, and I think that if you look at, at DevOps, 10 years from now, when we will have this podcast, I will have to remind you, or you will have to remind me what DevOps is, because yeah. it's just a period now that the all humanity is in transition. Right. We demand something else at the end of the day. My daughters, your kids, people around the world demand something else. My parents used to think about the pilot that sits in the cockpit. Today, yeah. I'm thinking about the software that yeah, the, the aircraft the, is, is yeah, updated They're going to take the pilots out of the cockpit. Eventually, it, I mean, if it was, there was a moment in time uh, a couple of years ago, after, before the Boeing disasters with this MAX, mm -hmm. that the number of um, people killed in commercial airlines had hit zero for a couple of years with the exception of suicidal pilots. There was an Egyptian pilot who downed a plane. There was a German pilot who ran a plane into a wall. And then there was a mountain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were like three of these cases where- All human error. That... Human suicide. There was yeah. literally suicidal oh, yeah. pilots Terrible. who were suffering from mental illness mm -hmm. were the cause of death. So we got to the point as a species, when you think about it and technology-wise, mm -hmm. where the technology and the mechanics and the engineering were so good that nobody died. It took a human consciously deciding through mental illness to kill people in a plane. It's wild when you think about it. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> crazy that crazy. we, like, the humans are now the weak part in the equation. We will have to trust software and computers more and more. Mm. And, and this is why software update is vital. And this is why we at JFrog think that liquefying software is beyond DevOps. Yeah. You know, when, when you think about music, and if you still remember the black records uh, sure, and yeah. the record Vinyl. players, yeah. that was a 50 years old industry that at some point started to be disrupted by digital music all the way to what we have today. Your Tesla doesn't even come with a CD player. No, um, no, no. And I, in I, the... I put an A-track in just for old times. So <laughs> I'm putting an A-track on the top just, just to be fun. ironic. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I have nothing else to do in the car. But, All right, Shlomi. Okay. Uh, great job today. And uh, everybody check out JFrog. They're hiring. We are hiring. Uh, as many We have as 126 open positions worldwide. Only 126. <laughs> There's not... Nine different offices in, in five different countries, and we are hiring, uh, we are growing. Um, yeah. And keep your eyes on the frogs. We promise yeah. to leap forward. Yeah, very well done. You have, uh, yeah, you have, a, you have a, a lot of puns you can do with JFrog. Uh, all right, we'll see you all uh, next time on the podcast. Thanks, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie. Thanks, Sir Charles, Master Nick, uh, the sales team for keeping the lights on. And if you want to uh, do us a favor, go ahead and rate the podcast in iTunes and write a review. My mom will appreciate it and read my book. <laughs> Angel, I have an Irish mom, but she's kind of like a Jewish mother too. I think the Irish and the Jewish mothers are the same. Very, very nice. She's like, I read nice. a review on Amazon of your book. <laughs> There were two new reviews this week, and I love them. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, And I'm mom. sure that you're waiting for her feedback more she, than everything else. Oh, my God, of course. <laughs> That's like my number one uh, champion. All right, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. Yeah.